It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hi, this is Andy. I have a special offer for loyal listeners of Accelerate. It's a no-obligation, free trial of my zero-time selling interactive online training. Now, I've worked with thousands of sales reps to teach them how to use my zero-time selling to boost their productivity and transform the results. And so if you want to learn the same proven strategies to help you open more doors, have more effective sales conversations with prospects, and close more orders, then my zero-time selling interactive training system is a fit for you. It's incredibly simple to start. Just take out your smartphone and text the word TRUST, that's T-R-U-S-T, to 96000. Now, do you have your phone ready? You're going to text us, send a text to 96000. That's a nine and a six followed by three zeros. Now, enter the single word message TRUST and hit send, and you hear right back from me with instructions on how to sign up for your free trial on my zero-time selling interactive training. I look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome to the show. You know, I couldn't be more excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Tom Hopkins, you know, the author of many best-selling books on sales, including one of my all-time favorites, How to Master the Art of Selling. I remember when I read that book for the first time and how it inspired me. And Tom is a world-class trainer, speaker, who's helped transform the productivity of sales teams literally around the world. And so it's especially appropriate that Tom joins us here for the kickoff series uh, right at the beginning of the new year, because now is the time to take stock of your situation Identify those areas where you need to invest some time to improve your capabilities and put in place an action plan to make that happen. And often that means examining the sales fundamentals and making sure that you're executing them in a disciplined fashion. And there's no one better equipped to tell us about what we should be doing right now at the start of the new sales year than Tom Hopkins. Tom, welcome to the show. Well, Andy, thank you for having me on. And I'm thrilled to talk about how to get ready for a new year because that's something that successful people definitely do. Yeah, yeah. So... If they're just on the off chance there's somebody out there that hasn't heard about you before, just tell us a little bit about you. Well, I got into the field of sales when I was 19, many years ago, and I found my niche. And I hope the people listening are fortunate to do a job, have a vocation, a career that in a way is a niche for them. And I call a niche doing something for a living that you love to do that you don't consider work. And I really haven't worked ever because I love so much what I do. I don't look at it like work. But I, at uh, 17, didn't uh, have the discipline to go to college. So I quit after 90 days. And then I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, Luckily, my uncle got me into the steel business. I became an iron worker in California carrying steel, hardest physical labor labor on the planet. Do they call that like a hod carrier? Well, no, uh, reinforcing steel is like the big bars that go on a bridge deck. Right. uh, Because concrete has no tensile strength without reinforcing rebar. And the main bar on a bridge deck is a number 11 bar, which is inch and three quarters in diameter, 60 feet long, and they weigh 200 pounds, and three men carry them. And I did that for a year, and uh, I, I'm now now five foot seven, but I teased people that I was 6'2 when I started <laughs> carrying steel, and look what happened to me. But uh, luckily, I, I my father was disappointed that I quit college suggested that I get into real estate. And of course, I I failed my real estate exam three times. Finally, I got a a license. And then, of course, I didn't have a car. So trying to sell homes on a motorcycle was not easy. (laughs) And not only that, none of the brokers wanted to hire me because I was 19. I looked very young and I'm riding a motorcycle. I don't even have a suit of clothes. And so it was tough. But finally, a broker gave me a chance. And luckily, uh, I found a mentor, a man. His name was J. Douglas Edwards. He was the father of American selling. That was his actual title, Andy. And everybody that was any good in sales went and listened to him. And I spent uh, years studying his records. This is back before we even had cassettes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he was my life changer. 
And I so am thrilled I ran into this man. And I spent the last 150 bucks I had in the bank to go see him for three days. And it was totally a life-changing experience. And much of what he taught me, as well as what Earl Nightingale and Norman Vincent Peale, much of the things I teach, I learned from these wonderful uh, teacher, trainers, uh, inspirators, and so that's kind of what I do today, just fly around the world teaching people how to have a better life and be more successful, Well, before is really great. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but before we, before we get into 2016, it really, you know, hearing you talk really sort of brings a question to mind is that we hear all the stuff about selling has changed. I mean, has it really changed? No, the fundamentals haven't changed. Uh, I will say this, the con- consumer is much more educated much more sophisticated today because of all the internet and all the information that they can get and they're better prepared when they go and look to purchase something. So I believe salespeople in all endeavors have to be better than they ever were before. Uh, That's one reason why motivation and training is so critical today uh, to not only stay motivated, but to, uh, know exactly what to say and do when you meet people. And is it, it seems like it's harder, though, to get people to invest their own time as salespeople, to invest their own time and money in improving. I mean, it, I remember one of the early lines in, in your book, Mastering How to Master the Art of Selling, which you talk about, you know, you are the greatest asset. You know, put your time and your effort and your money into training and grooming and encouraging your greatest asset. That was a quote, unquote. Um, you know, and that stuck with me because I read that earlier in my career, and that stuck with me. Uh, something that was the most important thing I could do is continue to invest in myself. So why, why does it seem to be so hard to get people to invest in themselves these days? Well, I feel that a lot of people, and I don't like to use the word cheap, but I will, a lot of people are either uneducated as to the importance of self-improvement or not realizing that they can take other mentors, men and women who've walked the path they want to walk, and can just emulate them, learn from them. They can save so much time by knowing what to do and say in communication skills, not just in selling, but in in business um, and life. And of course, you know, no one can teach you to do anything they haven't done. So you've got to find people who are the type you'd like to become. And I've always had a little saying, find the person you'd like to become and then walk, talk, act, and believe like they do. And in doing that, you will become like they are a successful person. And that's what I did with Mr. Edwards, uh, with the mentors that I found over the years. Right. No, I think it's a great, great lesson for anybody that's listening, that's getting started in their career or wondering why they're not achieving as much as they should is, yeah, who's, who's their role model? That's exactly right. I mean, I asked that question of all my guests, and you already answered it, so I won't ask you again at the end of the show. <laughs> but, but it's important to have one. I mean, because it then means that you actually are standing for something. And I think that seems to me that's one of the issues with newer people in their sales career, and you know, they haven't have much experience. Is, is they're just trying to, you know, sort of go at the flow, but they actually need to stand for something. Yeah, exactly. You have to have a purpose, and I think many people don't really have a conviction, a belief, a purpose that lights them on fire and excites them every day to go out and do a good job. Yeah, yeah. And as you talk about, sales is one of these professions that perhaps more so than certainly carrying steel and and others, you know, where you may be desk bound, is you can actually go out and have fun. Oh, it's a blast. When you know what you're doing in the field of sales, it is such a fun way of making a good living. Oh, you get to meet interesting people every day and talk to different people and learn things. I mean, to me, one of the things that was most has been most rewarding about the sales career is what I've learned from the people I talk to. Exactly. Every one of them can give you one idea, add them all up, and you've had one fabulous year. Yeah. Well, I always say I learn more from my customers than I ever give them. So uh, <laughs> if, you have, if you're out talking to a lot of people, you're going to learn a lot during the course of the year. So let's, let's get back into the topic we're going to start with is, is here 2016. We're at the beginning of the year. What, what do you need to do to look back to say, okay, what are the areas I should be working on going forward? You know, it's not just, hey, I didn't, maybe I made my numbers, maybe I didn't make my numbers, but, but how do you isolate those areas that really need your attention? Well, I think that goal setting is such a critical part of this overall subject of success. And many people 
spend more time planning the details of their two week vacation than they really spend planning the details of their next year's success. And so I think this is something that they need to do. They need to analyze, did they achieve their short-term goals, their long-term goals? And if not, I think they need to really sit down, spend a couple hours alone, or if they're married with their spouse, and say, let's get focused this year. Because all the earmarkings are, are there that 2016, as we get this elections po political situation taken care of, as I think business is, is picking up, all of my friends, I'm not an economist. I do have friends that are very successful as economists. And they all say that, hey, there's a real strong indication that 2016 is going to hold a lot of good things for people who, number one, are practicing the habits of success, who are surrounding themselves with excited, successful people, and who are paying the price of commitment, time and effort to do their job. Right. So if, if you're a, a uh, let's say, let's take two examples. One is, let's say you're a superstar and yeah, you, you crushed your numbers last year, but everybody has room to improve, right? How do you, and I'm talking not in necessarily just sales skills, but you know, how do you identify those maybe soft skill areas where you could do a better job? Well, one thing you could do, and this is something that I've, I've suggested to people who primarily are new in either opening up their own company or they're new in the field of sales. I've said to them that they should find 10 people that they respect. They could be in-laws, they could be relatives, they could be uh, business associates on the job they're working on. And, and if you could just you know, send them a letter and say, I'd love you to anonymously let me know what you think are areas that I can improve. And if you would help me with this, it'll make me a better person next year. And I think a lot of people might write you back. If, again, you make it anonymous, you, you, I'd even address 10 of the envelopes with your address on it and maybe even put in a piece of blank stationery. Make them, let them know that, you know, they don't need to let you know who they are, but if they could give you input, what could I do to be a better communicator, a more effective listener, uh, a better person in business. And you'd be amazed. Some of these people know you real well. And if they feel that, you know, they, you want the input, they'll give you some good insight as to what you can do to improve. Well, I think one of the things that's really key that you said there, though, that if, if people are paying attention on, so they're listening to the show, is that you weren't talking about getting feedback from people just purely in the sphere of business, right? Because who you are in your personal life is who you are in business. Exactly. And so, and so if you're not listening, if you're happy, you know, if you're having trouble communicating with people in your family or people in your life outside of work, uh, if you seem self-absorbed, if you're not there for them, if you're not in the moment for them, you're not going to be for your customer either. Exactly. Exactly. Show me who you are with your friends and relatives, and I'll get it'll be a good indication of what you'll be doing and how you react and have the relationships you'll develop in business. And so... One of the things I do when I work with clients is talk about having people put together a, not just their sales plan, but then also a personal improvement plan, right? Here are the things that I need to work on that aren't just purely my sales skills, though obviously they're, they're related, right? They all kind of have the same outcome, but, but I need to have something that's really focused on me as well. Definitely. I think, first of all, a person has to have financial goals as to their income, as to how they're going to increase their net worth, what are they going to do about debt resolution this year. And then, of course, so financial is one. Number two is emotional. I think people have to try to improve their ability to handle rejection, their ability to not take the word no personally. And then, of course, physically, I think people have to stay in shape. I mean, a lot of people get older and they've gained too much weight. Uh, they have bad eating or drinking habits. And you've got to be, you know, you've got to take care of yourself physically. And, of course, the fourth thing, which is a value decision, but the spiritual growth is important for a person. So if a person is totally fulfilled, they're achieving their financial, emotional, physical, and spiritual goals, and that makes them a totally fulfilled person. Yeah. So, uh, interesting point you had brought up and want to talk about is this, about handling rejection, right? This is, do you have 
tips for that? Because I know with salespeople, it's hard for some people to get over that, right? There's And you talk about the book, about fear being the big issue, that people have to identify their fears and attack their fears. How do they do that with rejection? Well, first of all, you've got to play a game with rejection, which let's just call the word no. And one of the games is find out how much income you make by getting a yes and closing a transaction. For example, let's just, I'll make some general figures here. Let's say that one closed sale might just make you $100. For some people listening, it could be a thousand, could be 10,000, but let's use for our example, a hundred. Mm -hmm. And let's just say you have to talk to five people to get one closed transaction or the hundred. So what happened was one person said yes, and the four said no. But now you divide the four no's into the money you made, the hundred, and in essence, each no is worth $25. So now you've got a dollar value on rejection. So instead of being down by being rejected, you say, hey, I got $25 worth of rejection. I'm going after the next no that I'm going to turn into a yes. And that's part of the game. Oh, I like that. Then, of course, what I do too, Andy, is I, I try my best to teach people that you know, you can't take rejection personally. You've got to work on getting a thicker skin. You have to realize that you're not the person that's really being rejected. It's either the timing is wrong, your product isn't fulfilling their need. And I also teach people attitudes we call towards rejection. And rejection in a way can be called a failure. So I teach them whenever they fail, they say, I never see failure as failure, but only as a learning experience. And if you learn from every failure, you'll now get better for the next presentation. Or I never see failure as failure, but only as the negative feedback I need to change course in my direction. So now the failure is a chance to change, which again is positive. Yeah. Or my favorite is I never see failure as failure, but only as an opportunity to develop my sense of humor, which means <laughs> if, if a person laughs every time they get rejected, there will be days in your career where you'll be in stitches all day long. Which is, I, I had those. <laughs> I, I had a bunch of those. So again, changing your attitude. And I hope the folks listening will, you know, make some notes, uh, learning experience, negative feedback, uh, develop sense of humor, uh, game I must play to win. I mean, these are things you have to internalize to where it's almost like you have a reflex. When someone says no, it's not negative. I grow from it to get in front of someone where I can get my yes. Exactly, exactly. All right, we're going to take a short break. But before we do, I have a question I ask each of my guests, and it's a little hypothetical scenario. And so here it is, and I'll get your answer after we come back from the break. So you've been hired as a new sales manager at a company whose sales have basically stalled out, and upper management's really anxious for you to be able to come in and make a, a real difference. So what two things would you do in the first week on the job that would have the biggest impact? So think about that, and I'll be back after the break with my guest, Tom Hopkins. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on demand service which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. Welcome back. My guest on the show today is my all-time favorite sales author, Tom Hopkins, author of How to Master the Art of Selling, which a book that had a personal impact on me when I first read it uh, and certainly was an inspiration. So, Tom, Right before the break, I posed a hypothetical scenario for you. You're a new sales manager hired into a company. They're anxious. You know, sales have stalled. They need to turn it around quickly. What two things would you do in the first week that could have the biggest impact? Well, I would start, Andy, before the first week. If I knew I was going to take over a branch or an office, I would want to have a lot of research done about each of the salespeople I was taking over. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of truth to these little ideas. Number one, it's difficult to change people who aren't willing to change. Now, I've taught some managers that over the years, if you can't change your people, you might have to change your people. 
which means you may have to look for some new folks that are excited. There are times in, in business that if you take over a new office and you have existing people who are really not motivated, who are not focused on their goals, who are not really committed to giving quality service to the clients, you may have to make some adjustments. And this is not easy, but that's one thing I would do is analyze all the people before you take over. Mm -hmm. Then you may have to have a strategic program of hiring and recruiting and getting some new people. I think a good manager, everywhere they go, they're looking for people who might fit into the company. Uh, I think you must always have new people coming in. I think you need to inspire the existing people by the fact that, hey, we are going to be the best in the company. We are focused on our goals. And I would also in the first week, I would get them on a self-improvement program to where, where as a manager, I would say every meeting we have on Tuesday, 20 minutes of it is going to be self-improvement. We are going to be taking, and it could be a book, could be a CD. Uh, there are many, many great authors out there. And you could maybe say, we're going to spend 20 minutes going through this CD or DVD program. And by making a 20-minute period of self-improvement, you should also have them take notes. And this, of course, is a wonderful way to inspire the people that maybe have been kind of coasting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they've replaced their old manager with you. So there is a challenge with that person. So again, that's another thing I would have upper management let me know. What do you think the challenges were with the manager I'm replacing? Right. And then, of course, I'm going to work on myself to do a better job than I have been doing to be the person that gets these people motivated, gets them goal oriented, gets them focused on better service and helps that company go back into the big profits. Excellent. Good answer. Good answer. So one of the things that was fascinating, going back through the um, your book again here recently, I reread it, is that you talk about the ability to be learn fast, to acquire and master new knowledge quickly, uh, was so important for sales success, and I, I believe that wholeheartedly. And it's funny how some thirty plus years after you've written the book, that topic is suddenly in vogue again, right? There's been several books written in the last year about this. This, what did you see then, or what did you know then that took everybody so long to catch up to? Oh, I, I think I just was an avid student of knowledge. I, I, I also found myself able to read a book with a yellow highlighter, highlighting the 10% on each page that was the most important. Now, the reason you do this is most pages of a printed book have maybe 10 to 20% of what I call the pearls on the page. And if I underline or, or score in a yellow highlighter as I read the book, every year now as I go back to basics and my reinforcement step, I uh, take out the books and only have to read the yellow highlights so I can read a book in 10% of the time that I read it the first time. And this, these are little ideas on gaining knowledge uh, more rapidly. And, of course, repetition is the mother of learning. I believe if you read something that you really want to remember, you not only have to make notes of it, but you have to recite the notes, read the notes. And anything you repeat six times, you'll have 62% retention and knowledge. And that's enough to make what you've learned work in the field of sales. Repetition, an interesting topic, because I, I agree. Again, I think that repetition is so key. But it seems like we run into situations with managers where now certain elements of salespeople are so metrics driven, right? You gotta make so many calls and, and bang out so many calls in a day. Is that yeah, they're getting a lot of repetition, but as you talk about, and also an author like Jeffrey Colvin in his book Talent is Overrated talks about, is unless that repetition is accompanied by coaching and that you're open to coaching and that you're modifying what you're doing, then the repetition doesn't really help you, right? I mean you're not learning. Well, definitely. It's, it's like comparing it to the game of golf. Uh, the game of golf demands a lot of repetition, which is practice on the practice tee. 
Now, if you have bad fundamentals and there's 14 reflex movements in a golf swing <laughs> to, to have the proper golf swing to get the trajectory and the distance of the golf shot. Well, I think my problem is I've only mastered two of those 14. Well, so. me too. <laughs> I mean, I am not a good golfer. I've studied the game. I've gone to many golf uh, schools. Uh, I've watched uh, Tiger Woods. He was a member of our course. And I've watched and watched. But again, unless I practice the right fundamentals with repetition properly, you'll never have it. Now, he comes out, I'll hit 10 balls and run to the first tee. He'll come out and they'll hit, put 500 balls in front of the great Tiger Woods. He'll spend, their four, spend four hours hitting balls. And here he's number one in the world. He outpractices everybody, even though he's number one. And that's why he is... And, of course, he and Phil Mickelson, they hit more balls than all of us do that aren't good golfers. Mm -hmm. It's just quality repetition, not just repetition. I have mastered golf fundamentals that don't work, and I do them well, and that's why I'll <laughs> never be a good golfer. <laughs> well, yeah, but also when they're out there, the pros are out there. And this is something I think people need to keep in mind as they listen to this. is When the golf pros are out on the range before you know, a round in a tournament, their coaches are right there with them giving them real-time feedback. And it's so important for coaches and managers, because I'm going to move into that topic for the rest of the, the segment here, is that you know, our, we're not just leaving it to the sales individual to plan what they need to do to be better in 2016, is they need the feedback from their manager to be able to help them decide which direction they should be going. Oh, definitely. Mentors and, and people that are coaches are so, so important for long-term success. And as I mentioned, I was fortunate to have some wonderful people who became, after I achieved a higher degree of success, they became friends, not just mentors. And I, I can tell you that Earl Nightingale, who most of the people listening would never have heard of him, but his uh, attitude material was foundational for me. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, Norman Vincent Peale's Think and Grow Rich and these type of books were so important to me. And I think that a lot of people don't have mentors or like are not students of the self-improvement and success. And, and I think one of the keys to success is always being a student, never. And, and I have a little saying, Andy, you can judge a pro by what they learn after they know it all. Which exactly. is a real, a real great little thing to live by. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got an expression, which is once you start thinking you know it all, then you're going to start failing. It's called know-it-all-itis, yeah. and it'll kill you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, I think that one of the problems I see with managers these days is they're so focused on, you know, they got their heads sort of buried in the CRM system is that they don't spend enough time coaching their people. And the people, this is the most important thing you can do on a day-to-day -day basis if you're a manager. So for managers that are listening, is, you know, start of the new year is look at your process that you use for coaching your people and mentoring your people and say, what more could I do to provide more value to them? Because you're only going to be as good as your people. Exactly. And I, I did something that, Andy, I want the folks to think about doing, especially managers. Uh, I was 24 years of age, my fifth year in real estate, and the company said, we want you to manage an office. And, of course, managing is nothing like selling. So I was told by another mentor, find a good management trainer. Well, back then, uh, there was a, a, a man named Michael Vance, who was the man that really was the creative thinker behind Walt Disney and Disneyland. He was the one that created most of the things you see in Disneyland. And he started doing management training. Well, I didn't tell a soul. And I went and took a whole five-day management seminar from him. And it saved me so much pain because most managers learn how to manage by spending the six months making so many mistakes. Exactly. And so I, my suggestion would be, if you are a manager, go to school, find a, a great management trainer. There's many of them. Sp get on a plane, go spend two or three days at, at their program and start bringing this into the company. Because you're only as good as your ability to lead and manage, which is a learned skill. And no one can teach it to you unless they have done it. So that's something I would suggest they do. Uh, I also believe that you have to find out what motivates the person that you're leading as a manager. 
And there's basically seven motivators for the average human being, money, achievement, recognition, security, love of family, acceptance of others, and self-acceptance. And as a manager, you have to kind of isolate what turns on this particular salesperson because you can't really manage everyone the same. Some people are number one motivator. I want to make a lot of money. Other folks start paying their bills, getting somewhat comfortable. The money's not as important as a feeling of achievement or they need recognition to be told that they're doing well. I think all managers need to be an, a supreme uplifter where you're always uplifting your sales staff to where you're making them proud to be working with you, where you're letting them know they're doing a great job. Catch, catch someone doing something right and praise them for exactly. it. Exactly. Know, celebrate the small successes as well as the big. Exactly. Oh, excellent. All right. Great advice. Well, we're going to move into the last segment of the show. I've got some sort of rapid fire questions to ask you. You can give me a one word answer or you can elaborate if you wish. Are you ready? Ready. So what's the most powerful sales tool in your arsenal? I would say my ability to speak as far as my words, eliminating rejection words. I would never say the word cost or price. It's the total amount. I would never say buy because they're afraid to do that. I would say own, which they want to do. Mm -hmm. I would never say sell or sold. I would get them involved in whatever I'm offering. So I believe I'm a wordsmith, which means I say the words properly that create positive emotions instead of negative, fearful emotions. So that, I think, would be my, my number one skill is communication through the words I use, the voice, and I apologize today, I just flew in from uh, China, and then I had a seminar in Baton Rouge all in a five-day period, and I spoke <laughs> for 18 hours, so I've, my voice is a little raspy, Andy, so I apologize. <laughs> no, it's, it's no problem at all. But, but I hope the words are still coming over good. Uh, they are, they are. Well, I, you, you raised something, I want to ask you a question. So another word choice is... Yeah. Uh, instead of asking the customer about making a decision, ask them about making a choice. Yes, I try to always give people an alternative choice, which means two, choi two choices to choose from. Shall we set it up for the 1st or the 15th? Shall we, shall we go ahead and uh, take care of the paperwork at my office, or would you like me to come by your home? Uh, I could see you at 6, or would 8 tonight be better? I love to give alternative choice questions where either answer I'm getting my agreement but I'm not asking them to make a decision. Excellent. So besides your own book, what's the one book every salesperson should read? Well, if they can find a copy of uh, a man's book called Og Mandino. Now, he's passed away. Sure. But Og Mandino wrote a book called The Greatest Salesman in the World. Now, I have a feeling if you went to um, uh, Amazon, they have books from the past. But I would suggest The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. I, I think you will always be able to pick up Think and Grow Rich, right. which it will always be out there. And I've read it so many times. But every time I read it, I look on a page, even though I've scored it with a yellow highlighter, I'll find a pearl that I might have missed. So I would say that would be one of the books that I would definitely have in my library and there's a lot of the, some new books out there. Gosh, when I first started, Andy, the business section in, in, in a bookstore uh, was just about maybe five to ten books. And now they're shelf upon shelf. Oh. And so you'll never run out of good ideas. And if you get one idea that can have a life-changing uh, um, feeling for you, then that's worth reading the whole book. Absolutely. So what's the first sales activity you do every day? Well, normally I, I'm a kind of a fanatic on being in shape and working out. Uh, so I have a ritual. My, my wife and I normally have a cup of coffee and then watch a little bit of uh, a, a little news, not to get negative, but just want to see what's going on in the world. And then we have a gym in our home that we go into and I do 45 minutes of cardiovascular and then 15 minutes of muscle toning. And that is my beginning of my day. And then, of course, I normally I'm getting on a plane at least once a week, flying somewhere in the world to do a seminar. So that has been going on for many, many years. But, you know, when I am home and not working, I try to play golf or I love taking my wife out. We love movies as well. 
So yeah, it's a great, it's a great fun life when you've been able to have been fortunate to achieve a degree of success. Yeah, excellent. So last question. What's the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople? Uh, when do you really close the sale? That's what people always, they, salespeople always say, Tom, when do you actually, when do you close? And what's your answer? Well, you really start the process the moment you meet someone, meaning it's not at the end. It's the way you shake their hand, the eye contact, the way you use their name, the way you have a nice greeting, and it all builds and the actual closing, the final closing begins when you just simply have given them all the facts. They must know the money. But then you just simply say, how are you feeling about all this so far? And if they go, well, it sounds pretty good. Well, let's just draft up our feelings on the paperwork and see if going ahead even makes sense. And when you do that, you start filling out your paperwork. You then get their approval signature and you get your check if you need money. And that's what I try to teach. And I just did that, which normally would take an hour and 15 minutes. So I gave you the 30-second version. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, people should take that and go out and make some money. So I want to thank you for joining me today. My guest has been Tom Hopkins, author of How to Master the Art of Selling, world-famous sales trainer. Tom, tell folks how they can find out more about you. Well, I'd love them to go to our website, TomHopkins.com. And, of course, they can get onto my blog. They can get free resources. We have thank you notes. We have a lot of stuff that we have. As, uh, it's called a free resource page. It'll let them know where our seminars are. And hopefully they'll see a book or a CD. And maybe the managers would want to get a book or a CD as a gift for their one of their salespeople. Because, boy, the best gift you can give is self-improvement education, which, of course, thankfully, it's still tax deductible by IRS. So what a wonderful Christmas present. So hopefully they'll do that, Andy. That I sounds sure great. Enjoyed, I sure enjoyed talking to you. And keep accelerating. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I want to remind everybody out there, remember, make it a part of your day, every day, to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. Now, subscribing to this podcast can be an easy way to do that because then you'll make sure you don't miss any of our conversations with leading business experts like our guest today, Tom Hopkins, who share their expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining us. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.